Hello and welcome to Dogs with Torches Medievalist Podcast. In this episode, we are joined with Dr. Michael Drought to discuss the medieval poem Beowulf and a scholarship centered around Beowulf studies. Dr. Drought is a professor of English at Wheaton College and the director of the Center for the Study of Medieval at Wheaton College. He specializes in medieval fantasy and Anglo-Saxon literature, and he is a distinguished Beowulf and J.R.R. Tolkien scholar. Dr. Drought, thank you so much for joining with us. Thanks very much for having me. So I figured we'd sort of just dive in and uh, discuss maybe some of the brief summary of uh, the poem's composition and sort of a rough picture of its dating and and authorship or or maybe lack thereof. Uh, what, what, when approximately was the uh, the Beowulf written, and who, who wrote the Beowulf the Beowulf epic, and who was the intended audience of the poem? <laughs> so you decided to start with the uh, the most controversial and contentious uh, things in in Beowulf scholarship, and um, probably among the most contentious topics in in all of literary study. I actually saw a. Um, a very small bar fight break out over an argument over the dating of Beowulf. I mean, there was no like people weren't throwing chairs, but there was definitely beer knocked over and yelling. Um, <laughs> so that as the setup there, uh, it, it is it is controversial. Um, the real issue is that we have only one manuscript of of Beowulf. Uh, that manuscript was copied sometime between. Uh, 975 and, and uh, 1025 or so, probably right around the year 1000. But almost no one thinks that the poem itself is um, kind of coterminous with that manuscript. Uh, there's, there's features of the manuscript, types of errors and so forth that pretty strongly show that it's at least a copy of a copy. Uh, the, the big question is how far back does it go? And so I'll take the opposite end. Beowulf could not have been composed, um, well, before 526 or so, which nobody thinks it's even close to, to that because there's a, a mention of a historical event in Beowulf that happened around then. So it has to be after that and it has to be before a thousand. So only 500 years or so of, of argument there. Um, mm. But it essentially really boils down to that uh, there's a, a fairly large group of scholars who, like Tolkien, uh, see the poem as being composed somewhere around 750. And then there's uh, another group uh, that was pretty dominant between, like, say, 1980 and and 2010 or 2000, 2000 or so that would date the poem uh, quite a bit later to sometime in the the later 800s or even into the the uh, the tenth century. So it's it's somewhere in there. Um, it's also a, an Anglo-Saxon uh, text that we do not know where it was written. Usually, we can identify where texts are written based on other texts that have the same handwriting or, or mm. other similarities, Beowulf isn't really like anything that's really very um, localizable. So it was probably written in um, the Anglian rather than the Saxon parts of England. So, you know, possibly in, in East Anglia or um, Mercia is usually the, the sort of default idea. So possibly written somewhere around Oxford area. Uh, Tolkien would have liked, uh, would have liked that. Mm. And, um, you know, the, the, the time, sometimes people guess that it was written um, near Malmesbury, uh, which is, which is out by, by Oxford. Um, but it's really, it's not known if it has any kind of manuscripts that are that are sort of like it one of those is the the, the manuscript that has the blickling homilies in it one of the rare anglo-saxon manuscripts we were able to steal for america um before the british rules changed so it's at princeton um but we don't know where that one came from either so it doesn't really help so we have no idea about the author we have no idea about the location and we can only narrow the date down to about three centuries I see. Yeah. So in this way, it's very much different from uh, someone like a Jeffrey Chaucer, who we, we very much know Chaucer's time period and, and maybe sort of the, the, the maybe the audience of 
of the Canterbury Tales. But with Beowulf, I mean, if, if, it, if you know, the, the, those five centuries we have to worry about, it, like any period during that time, it could have been written. That that, that does sort of complicate uh, uh, scholarship. But 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 with respect to um. Beowulf uh, as a piece of literature. How would you best describe the uh, the poem itself? Would you say that it makes sense to describe it as a, as an epic poem? Because I, I remember reading uh, Tolkien's uh, uh, essay, uh, Monster and Critics, where he, he sort of takes issue with that. We really shouldn't describe it as an epic poem, more like an elegy. But what, what would be your thoughts on on that? So I think what has what has happened since uh, 1936, when Tolkien wrote uh, Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics, which was really an essay that that totally changed the the shape of Beowulf um, scholarship and criticism. Um, I think now people would say that Beowulf is an epic, but they've redefined epic. So mm -hmm. in the past, uh, you know, when Tolkien when Tolkien was writing that, epic meant like the Odyssey or the Iliad. Or maybe if you're really stretching it, like Virgil's Aeneid, mm. and meaning that it either was a story, a very long story about a great event like the Iliad, or about one um, man's sort of adventures through through life, like like the Odyssey, um, and it would be associated with the founding of nations and, and things like that. And Beowulf isn't like that. Um, Beowulf is sort of, uh, as Tolkien put it. It's sort of two great moments in the life of a, of a great hero. It's the, the first moment, the first two thirds of Beowulf is about when um, uh, our, our protagonist of the poem travels to uh, Denmark and, and fights monsters and sort of demonstrates his, his true, um, you know, greater than the normal uh, strength and bravery and ability. And then uh, we find out almost nothing, uh, very little bits of summaries between what happens then and a time 50 years later when a fire-breathing dragon shows up in Beowulf's homeland and he goes out and, uh, and fights and, and defeats the, the dragon. So that's what Tolkien was getting at when saying it's not like, you know, it's not like any kind of epic that mm. you knew from... Greek uh, or Latin texts, or even something like, say, the Song of Roland. But I think that the definition of epic um, has sort of been been remade now. So we recognize it as uh, Beowulf as an epic in that it has sort of a combination of um, supernatural qualities, but they're not the forefront of the story, that it's about uh, heroism. And this is the most important part, that it takes place in what Tolkien called the named lands of the North. It's not in a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away or mm. in, um, you know, in Neverland or anything like that. And even when you say like something is set in Middle Earth, uh, Tolkien took that term from Anglo-Saxon and Middle Earth simply actually, simply meant like in our world, not in the, the heavenly or the subterranean um, you know, a mm. supernatural world. So right. that's what he means there. It's, it's set, it's, in other words, it's set in Denmark and Southern Sweden and Frisia and areas that you could recognize, but yet it has things like fire breathing dragons and trolls and people with the strength of 30 men and so forth. Mm. If, if I can ask with um with respect to uh, the historiography centered around Beowulf, how has Beowulf scholarship sort of evolved in the past 50 or, or 70 years or, or, or so? Has, 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 it, uh, has the opinion on the poem sort of progressed or changed uh, at all yes. significantly? Absolutely, it has. And, and Tolkien is responsible for, for uh, a lot of that, though maybe not quite as, as black and white as, you know, sort of sort of potted history of the discipline would suggest that sure. you know everybody was just stupid and wrong until Tolkien showed up and now right, right. it's not really like that but um so one thing to remember then a lot of uh people even in like English departments aren't aware of this is that Beowulf's really only been known and and in any way influential for 207 years or so um, the first edition of the poem was in 1815. It was sort of 
word that it existed had kind of gotten around in antiquarian circles in the, the latest part of the 1700s. But it's not really until you get an edition in 1815, um, that's Latin, uh, a Latin translation of the poem. And uh, it's really 1834 before it really makes a mark on anything in English. So it, it has a fairly short critical history. I mean, mm -hmm. compared to something like Chaucer uh, right. or even Shakespeare, even though it's much older, it's sort of, we don't actually know anything at all about what happened to the Beowulf manuscript between when it was created around the year 1000 and when it shows up in the collection of somebody named Lawrence uh, Noel in uh, around the, uh, the 1560s or so. Uh, just absolutely no idea where where it was, but anyway, the poem um, starts getting studied in the in the early part of the 1800s, and for about a hundred years, most of the study of the poem was was either simply trying to figure out what the heck it was actually saying. I mean, there was just required a lot of study of the language and, and cross comparison with with other texts and trying to figure out what the poem actually said. Uh, and, and then for what was like the, the literary criticism of it, it was basically comparing it to Homer and Virgil and saying it's not as good. I mean, that, that's, so that's what Tolkien is when he writes that um, Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics, uh, his, his great uh, lecture, he's taking aim at a critic named um, W.P. Kerr, who sort of wrote these a couple you know, very influential uh, books called uh, Epic and Romance and the Dark Ages, in which Kerr says, you know, there's, there's a lot of great things about Beowulf, but it absolutely isn't nearly as good as the Aeneid or the Odyssey. And Tolkien's answer is like, well, who says it's supposed to be the Aeneid or the Odyssey? Mm. Like you're trying to judge it in like not its own terms. And so uh, what he says is, let's pause for a second and let's just look at what the poem is trying to do. You know, and, and one of the questions, uh, one of the things that previous scholars had said is there's just too many monsters. Like you have this troll monster and the troll monster's mother, and then you have a dragon. Like, I mean, I can see one monster, like, you know, the Hydra or Procrustes or, or something like right. that, but, but two monsters or three is just too much. And Tolkien's like, that's idiotic. <laughs> like if, if one monster is a good way to start his career, you don't want to have him just die in some war against Sweden at the end. It needs another bigger, scarier monster. And he sort right. of works through what the aesthetics of, of Beowulf would, would be. Um, the other thing, then this is the part that's been really misunderstood, I think. Um, Tom Shippey and I have been kind of batting this back and forth between us, trying to get other people to, to listen, is yes, Tolkien goes, like, uh, does a lot to say, stop using Beowulf as history and focusing on, you know, what it could maybe tell you about the, the, the sixth century or whatever, and instead mm -hmm. think of it as, as a poem. But he did not say, and actually didn't do, like kind of stop paying attention to the, the history in the poem or the, the, the actions of humans in the poem. But he was just saying like, let's get these things in their proper proportion. Uh, so unfortunately what happened is after Tolkien, much Beowulf scholarship just totally decides to, yeah, let's not even bother to talk about like the Swedes and the Danes and Beowulf's own people, uh, which there should be pronounced the Yeats, but everybody just calls them the Geats. Um, like what's, you know, let's not pay attention to that. Let's just pay attention to monsters and heroism. And that's as bad in its own way as the let's ignore the monsters sure. school of criticism um, before Tolkien. So it, it's sort of my sense that right now, you know, we're not quite a hundred years after the monsters and the critics, but we're getting there, right? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, another what fourteen or or so, and and so what's what's happening in Beowulf scholarship right now is sort of a somewhat of a reorientation, um, so that like we can not mine the poem to say like, oh, look, this proves that at this date, this is, you know, this king was king of something here. But to see that 
the the history, the politics, whatever you want to call it, the relationships among humans in the poem are pretty consistent mm. um, with each other and kind of and make sense. And actually, they make the monster fight stuff make more sense rather than less. So that's sort of where we are right now. Gotcha. All right. Then, well, and if I can also ask, uh, what language uh, is the Beowulf epic, epic written in? Is it, it, um, it as I as I understand it, uh, one of the problems, w w another theme that, that Tolkien focused on was translating Beowulf. And, and on his essay, he talked about how many of the words in the original poem are so archaic and foreign to modern language that it's kind of difficult to have an adequate translation of, of the whole thing. So, well, it's it's hard to have an adequate translation that also follows the same um, poetic features. It's mm. it's it's not hard to just straightforwardly like translate the poem. I mean, there are occasional uh, like the words that we don't know at all, uh, like what they mean, are fairly rare. Like one of my one of my favorites is that there's this um, line in the middle of the poem that says, "And there was uh, easy." gold, which would be literally translated to icy gold, which is hard to know what that means, right? And and so therefore, there's been tons of speculation, gold that's shiny and glitters like ice, or gold that's this, or gold's, and my, my uh, John Foley, uh, my professor of, of Old English, uh, as someone was starting to do that, he goes, it means some sort of gold, move on. <laughs> right. With, with, the, with the point being that, like, that's not really getting in our way of understanding what's going in the poem. Sure. So the, the translating problem is that um, Old English, Anglo-Saxon uh, was, it's an inflected language like Latin or, uh, or Greek. So it doesn't have, it doesn't use a lot of like little unstressed words the way we do in English. In other words, that it, it, it doesn't, it has endings, like sort of like our apostrophe S for possessive, which you could also replace with of, right? And, um, but it has that for all the, the cases. So you don't really need to use a lot of words in Old English, like with, on, in, under, and, and so forth. Right. What that, and, and the poem works in this kind of alliterative um, and stress-based uh, structure. So it doesn't require rhyme. Um, and it, it, uh, it, it's very compressed. Uh, to just to give you a, a sense of it, like the, you know, the opening of, of Beowulf is, um, you know, what we gardena in yirdagum theod kuninga thrimya frunan, who tha athlingas elin fremadan, off chilled shafing shiathana triatum monigum myothum medos et la oftea, eoso de erla, sith an erest werth, feaschat fundin, hetas frofreya bead. And what you what you see there, if you saw it on the page, is there's not a lot of little unstressed patter words, mm. but it's really really hard to write modern English without those patter words. We need all of our you know all of our little widths and ins and unders and ons, sure. and so it's very hard to imitate the structure of the the line when you're copying it. So just to give an example, the second line of Beowulf that I just read, Theod Kuninga Thrim Yefrunan. Okay, so Theod Kuninga is kings of the people. Right there, we've had to add, a, a, you know, a, an of and a the, right? And we've made it, so we said Theod Kuninga, which can be just a full half line by itself. Now it's like kings of the people or mm. people kings, which doesn't even sound really uh, useful in modern English. And then thrim yefrunan. So thrim is like valor and yefrunan is accomplished. So you can translate that line is how those kings of the people accomplished valor. You end up with a lot of syllables and you end up with being really difficult to also find synonyms that give you the alliteration there. So it, it, translating Beowulf has been, um, it's not been one of the most uh, successful uh, activities to, to truly try to get the, the sense and the feel of the poem in a translation. Uh, so that's why, you know, Tolkien, Tolkien's own um, prose translation, and I worked on um, uh, 
his uh, prose and his uh, unfinished poetic translation for a while until uh, Christopher Tolkien uh, decided that he would be doing that himself and not having um, having me me do it. And he like it's it's fine, it's logical, and it makes sense. It doesn't work very well as as a poem. Mm. Um, so you know, you had in two thousand or so, Seamus Haney, uh, you know, Nobel Prize winner. Uh, came out with his translation, and that's still the one I use. Um, it has some weirdnesses in the first third, but then Haney just kind of buckles down and, you know, to so the first third, he's trying to make sort of some political statements about colonialism and and uh, the place of, um, you know, he grew up in, in, a, in, in Belfast, and so there's, there's some oh. relations there that he ends up kind of choosing sort of odd words to translate uh, different... Uh, sure parts but then he just buckles down and it's a beautiful sad powerful um, poem he doesn't stick too closely to he used alliteration but he doesn't stick as tightly uh to doing it the same line by line and and so forth um the most recent translation that everyone's been talking about in the past i don't know eight nine months is by um maria devana headley and she has done sort of what people are, are calling like a, a feminist uh, inspired uh, translation of, of Beowulf that has, it, it's gone to sort of a different register. And the best way I can explain this is that the first word in Beowulf that I translated what, right? Mm. It just means what, but it's, um, it's a it's it's a marker that a poem is starting now. It could be like "hark" at the beginning of "hark the herald angels sing," sure. or um, "lo" and then something else. And people have translated it as "what ho," and it would also work as like "yo" at the beginning of a rap song and so right. forth. <laughs> so Seamus Haney translates it as "so," mm. and he explained this by thinking that he thought Beowulf was a lot like one of the stories his old uncles would tell. You know, and after dinner and stuff, they'd lean back by the fire, you know, and maybe like loosen their belt or something and say, so, and right. tell a story. And it works beautifully for what Haney's doing. Well, Maria Devana Headley translates that as bro. And it works beautifully <laughs> in another sense, right? Like that instead of it being, you know, this is a very serious old story told from, um, you know, this uncle's uh, perspective who's going to tell you something about your past and, and everything. It's like bro, you got to hear this story about this guy Beowulf who just like ripped the arm off a monster and so forth. Right, right. And, and so, what, I mean, the linguistic term we use there is register, right? Like you, the choice of words that you use to translate something, you're coming across in, in different registers of language. You can be formal, you can be colloquial, you can be like even technical or medical or, or whatever. And so what you see with Haney and, and Headley are these um, attempts to put the poem into different registers because honestly, we don't know what it, what, I mean, we assume that this was something that would be, I mean, it takes three hours and 17 minutes to read it. So was this poem ever performed you know, as a as an oral piece, we can imagine all the pieces of it being performed. You can imagine it being performed. People have, you know, they have long attention spans um, in the, in the past, in the dark winter nights, and so forth. Mm -hmm. But we just we just don't know. And so each sort of translation of Beowulf becomes a rewriting it, sort of a speculative um, investigation of okay, if it were a formal set piece, or if it were. Uh, a story that some old person is telling you like from way back in the, in your own past, or if it were like a, something told like right away of this, Oh, you, you would never believe what happened when I met this, this guy Beowulf. Gotcha. Well, then I guess that brings us sort of to my second question is uh, what translation of, uh, and I, I, I guess there, 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 there's sort of different translations for, for, for different aspects of the poem you'd want to focus on, but what would you say what would be the, the translations you would recommend? So I, I still, I teach the Haney. I've been teaching with Haney for 25 years, um, or no, sorry, that would be wrong because it didn't come out till 2000, but close, 20, 22 something years since it came out. Um, and although there are places where Haney kind of takes liberties or uh, translates things differently than I certainly, uh, certainly than I would, um, I feel that it, it, it captures, 
something of the to me the the, the dignity and, and sadness of of the poem mm. but um you know and i have not uh, I, i've read parts of the uh, headley translation the new one that that's popular and i think that there's some real value there um you know my colleague uh roy liutza came out with a translation around the same time as he haney that is very much more precisely what's in the poem, you know, like almost line for line, keeping gotcha. that the the material in the poem, but still trying to make it poetic. And there's others like E. Talbot Donaldson's or S. A. J. Bradley's, which are just straight out like prose, you know, just a tro what we would call a trot, uh, just telling you exactly what happens in English, but without any attempt to be uh, poetic at at all. And, um, and Tolkien's 2014 translation, the prose translation, is sort of in the middle. He occasionally, you know, will use his facility with language and you'll have a beautiful line, um, you know, or something that, that just happens to, to work without him, you know, having to do anything, like take any liberties uh, with yeah. the text to get it to fit the poetic form. So th those, those are all um, useful uh, you know, useful um, versions of the poem. And none of them is gonna really terribly lead you astray. I figured that we, we could maybe shift from the historiography to maybe discussing the, uh, the historiography and, and uh, translation and maybe discuss the content of, of the poem itself. And maybe we, we can give an overview of the epic poem and sort of how it all progresses. Sure, um, I, can, I can do my, my best on that. Um, so I think at the beginning of our, our talk, I said that the poem is, uh, it happens in sort of two, sort of two settings, really. Uh, the, the first is in Denmark, and it's about two thirds of the poem. And the second is in Jatland, which we think of as what's now Southern Sweden. So across the, you know, part of the, the sea from, from Denmark. In the first half of the poem, uh, we learn that there's a, the king of the Danes, Hrothgar, has um, built a, a mead hall, a, um, you know, a, a sort of symbolic central place in a kingdom uh, mm -hmm. where you would gather to drink mead and um, exchange uh, promises of loyalty and, and listen to entertainment like perhaps Beowulf. Uh, and he's built this in, um, in the home, his, uh, you know, center of his kingdom. And um, there, so King Hrothgar has built a, uh, a mead hall that the poet says was, was larger than any of the children of um, men had ever heard of. And interestingly enough, there's now uh, archeological evidence that the place that we think is meant by uh, Herod, there actually were like a couple of giant mead halls there. Uh, in any event, right after he builds this mead hall and they're celebrating it, that night, a, a monster uh, breaks in, uh, and a monster named Grendel. Seems he's, uh, he's, he's bipedal, he's humanoid in some way, but he uh, eats a bunch of Hrothgar's men, mm -hmm. and he keeps coming back and doing that until the hall is sort of un... Um, they, they just can't sleep there at, at night. And that's, a, that's more of a, a strike at sort of like the symbolic heart of the the kingdom because he doesn't go and then track people down in their individual houses and stuff and you know mm. eat the women and children or something he just says you can't use this mead hall so 12 years pass and the the whole like area knows that this is going on and a uh, heroic man named beowulf shows up with some of his men in, in Denmark and says, I want to fight your monster. Uh, he says like, you know, King Hrothgar helped my father once and I want to fight the monster for him. So there's a lot of very formal uh, back and forth uh, because one of the things is that the Danes are allied with the Swedes uh, and Beowulf people, the Yeats, the Geats, are enemies of the Swedes. So it's like a little bit strange for a bunch of geats to be showing up in, in Denmark. But mm -hmm. but in any event, um, after a lot of back and forth talk, it's decided that yes, Beowulf, you and your men can uh, sleep in the hall and see if you can fight um, Grendel. So that night, Grendel breaks into the hall 
he eats one of Beowulf's men right in front of Beowulf. Like Beowulf just watches it. And it's, it's very like trying to figure out why it, this is the poet does it this way is, is uh, not easy. Uh, no one has a really great answer for that. But after Grendel has, has consumed completely this man, uh, Beowulf attacks him, they fight, and eventually Beowulf rips his arm off. Mm-hmm. And then Grendel runs back to the swamp that he uh, lives in, leaving a, leaving a blood trail that they're able to find the next morning. And um, I, still, I still will claim that the, the poet really missed an opportunity where I think that Beowulf should have beaten Grendel with his own severed arm, saying, <laughs> why are you hitting yourself? Right, uh, right. <laughs> but, but that doesn't happen. Um, so anyway, they, they go, they, they, they assume that Grendel's dead. There's a lot of celebration. There's a lot of gifts given and so forth. And then finally, the Danes are able to sleep in their own mead hall. And then that night, uh, another monster shows up. This time, it's Grendel's mother who's never been mentioned to this point in the poem. So she's kind of a surprise. Mm. And she takes back her son's arm and, um, and also grabs like Hrothgar's most beloved counselor, who's also never been mentioned to this point in the poem and drags him off. So the next morning, everyone's very sad. Beowulf walks in and says, oh, how are things going? And Hrothgar's, oh, don't even say it. Sorrow is renewed. Mm. Um, There's, you know, there's a terrible thing. And Beowulf's like, okay, well, I'll, I'll kill that monster too. So they lead him to this haunted mirror where there's fire burning on the water and sea monsters and, and other uh, like visions of terror. Mm-hmm. They will dives in uh, to the mirror, swims down, ends up in a cave uh, that's under the water. Um, and there is Grendel's mother. He fights with her. He's actually losing the fight, not doing well because his sword uh, doesn't work. The sword it just won't bite on her. But then he sees a giant sword conveniently hanging on the wall, uh, a sword so huge, no normal person could use it. But fortunately, Beowulf has the strength of 30 men. So he grabs a sword uh, and then he kills Grendel's mother. And then he cuts the head off Grendel and brings the head back to Herod. But in the meantime, everyone had seen all the blood in the water and the, the Danes had said, oh, well, that was the end of Beowulf. This is so sad. And they've left. So his own men uh, stayed there. Mm. So then he goes back to the hall. There's great celebrations. There's um, more gifts and so forth. And then Beowulf sails back to, um, to Geatland, uh, where he tells his uncle, the King Hijlak, the entire story that you've just heard already. He retells it. Um, and... Hijlak is very proud of him and basically gives him half the kingdom. Um, and then there's this like, little like five lines which basically says, and then 50 years passed and now Beowulf was king. And then a dragon shows up. And uh, the dragon showed up because a, a servant or a slave who was in trouble with his master had broken into the dragon's barrow and stolen a cup. And if you see echoes of um, Bilbo taking a cup from Smaug, those right. aren't accidental. Right. So the dragon has been disturbed. It's upset. It flies out and burns Beowulf's uh, castle to the ground. He's not in it for some reason when that happens. So Beowulf's very upset. And um, he says, just like I fought Grendel, I'm going to fight this monster also by myself. So his uh, major thanes and hearth com- heart companions follow him up towards the barrow, but then they hide in the woods. Now, to be fair, he told, tells them to, because uh, he's going to go fight the monster by himself. Goes to fight the dragon. It's not going well. And one of Beowulf's men named uh, Wiglaf, uh, Wilaf, uh, which means like a uh, remnant of war or, or something that you, you've got after war, uh, and interestingly is cognate with the name Viggo, as in Viggo Mortensen, who played Aragorn in um, <laughs> Lord of the Rings. Uh, so Wiglaf decides to disobey his Lord's orders because he just can't imagine leaving him to fight this monster by himself. He goes, the two of them fight together against the dragon. They're able to first stab it in the belly, which makes its fire go out. And then Beowulf's able to kill it. Uh, but Beowulf has been received a poisoned wound and he soon dies. Uh, Wiglaf berates all the cowardly retainers, and then it's prophesied that now that Beowulf is dead, 
the all the enemies who've been kept at bay by rumor of his you know enormous prowess will come and uh, basically destroy the the people of the the Geats. And uh, the poem ends with the lament at uh, at Beowulf's funeral. Fascinating. So it ends on a very down. Doesn't end on well, Beowulf is dead, but long live King Wiglaf. Right. Uh, right. Instead, it, it's like Beowulf is dead, and boy, was he a great king. Um, and that's sort of it. Gotcha. So it ends on this elegiac or sad note, which is why Tolkien said that you should maybe instead of calling it an epic, you should call it an elegy because it doesn't. It doesn't explain like the formation of a people like the Aeneid does for right. Rome or or anything like that. It simply is like this was a great thing that happened and now he's dead. So if, if I can then ask uh, with respect to Grendel and Grendel's mother, you know, what is Grendel? What is Grendel's mother? As I understand it, the poem's a little bit vague about uh, describing them. Uh, and then that sort of led, led to a sort of like area of scholarship of speculation as to what kind of creatures they might be? Well, the, within the poem itself, they're pretty troll-like. Um, they get called, uh, Grendel gets called a Thursa, which um, is pretty, that's a, it's a troll of some sort. But that doesn't really give us a lot of information. As, as I point out, like, if Beowulf sits there while Grendel completely eats one of his men, Right, like, like then Grendel has to have a mouth like bigger than a lion. Right, because lions can't even gulp down, you know, people in in, in just whole, you know, three right. or four bites. Sure. Or Beowulf sat and watched it for like an hour, which is almost not not likely there. Right. So there's some kind of confusion, or if confusion is not the right word. Like, it's it's hard to picture, you know, what is what is the poet wanting us to see in certain moments? So at one point when Grendel is breaking in the door of the hall, he seems to be filling the doorway, but like how large, you know, how large was that? Is he like maybe what, 13, 14 feet tall? Um, something like that? Sure. Possibly. Um, you know, he obviously has big, uh, has a, an arm with big giant sharp nails on it. Cause those are, those are described. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other question is like, it's weird about Grendel's mother because one, she just kind of pops into the story. You know, it's like Rothgar says, oh, oh, that must be that men told me there was a second monster also, which in the, the 2007 semi-animated movie by Robert Zemeckis, there's, there's, that at least is done well in that Beowulf's like, you know, that was relevant information. Right. You didn't tell me there were two monsters. How many more? Are there three, four, five? But, but anyway, um, he says there's this second monster that is as uh, in the relationship of the first monster as, as a woman is to a man. So like smaller and, and, and not as strong. And that seems like a weird story wise, a weird way to have the second monster. It's like, well, it's just like the first one, but not as strong. Right. But then of course she turns out to be more dangerous um, in the fight in that she Beowulf can't just like, you know, like rip her arm off or whatever, she's actually got him sort of pinned down and it's only because he's wearing his, his um, armor uh, that, that he, she doesn't uh, kill him there. So it's, it's hard to know what's going on. There's a couple parallels in sources from, um, from Iceland, um, something called Greta Saga, that, that led people to think of this as what they call the two troll tale. But in, in those two troll tales, the second monster is usually like magical or in some way and not just like another, but not quite a strong troll. And at one point describing the first monster, describing Grendel, um, it says something about uh, Halirunas, which Tolkien translates as haunting shapes of hell, but uh, it's hard to figure, figure out, except that the Halirunas that show up in uh, Gothic and, and a few other uh, like very, very old uh, texts, all are female and they're all female like necromancers in some way. In other words, they, they brought the dead back to life or they, they control the dead uh, in some way. Mm -hmm. And so there's at least, I have at least a hunch that in the, whatever was the folktale, you know, antecedent of, of Beowulf, that it might've been a two troll tale with the second troll being, you know, the second monster being female and smaller. But I think that monster was more dangerous because it was magic 
in some way. And for whatever reason, our poet doesn't want that. Um, in fact, the magic aspects of the monsters get like, so Beowulf, um, one of the things Beowulf does to fight Grendel is he takes off all his armor and hands his sword to one of his men and says, I've heard that Grendel doesn't use weapons, so I'm not going to use weapons either. But then this turns out to be a very, very good idea because the poet says that Grendel had enchanted weapons, so they wouldn't work against him anyway. But it's, it's done in a surprisingly clumsy way. I mean, it makes me feel like that the, the poet was got to a certain point and was like, oh crap, I forgot to say that Grendel's immune to weapons. Mm. And so kind of, and then the word that's used there uh, is forsweron, which is in modern English is forsworn, but forsworn means like deliberately renounced or gave up. It doesn't mean put a magic spell on. Right. Right. So there's a lot of little things like this. The other thing that happens is when Beowulf retells the whole story, he says that Grendel carried a bag made out of dragon skin that he was going to stuff Beowulf into. It's never mentioned in the first part. And also that the Beowulf's man who got eaten was named Hanshao. And that's weird because Hanshao means hand shoe, which means glove. And Grendel's giant bag is called a glove. I mean, glove mm. originally meant just bag and then it, you know, did bag with fingers or whatever. So sure. it, like there's something going on, like hand shoe got put in the glove. Hmm. Is, but, but the poet doesn't do anything with that and mentions it later. And, and that's why I feel like that one of the things going on in this poem, um, and Tolkien I think felt the same way, is that our poet is repurposing a lot of older stuff okay. for his own theme. Like, in other words, he's doing a lot of what like a modern writer would do when you would retell some kind of, you know, you'd want people to recognize that there's some kind of echo with a folk story. So just to an example, if you did a, a you know, if any movie that, that came out now that had a young um, uh, female heroine who was menaced by, by something or other, if you put her in a red jacket or a red hat or in something, right? You'd immediately get the Red Riding Hood vibe. Sure. Even if you deli weren't diluting anything beyond that with the story, like there's no wolf, there's no parallels. I feel like that something like that is going on here that like the whole audience, but not us, unfortunately, sure. would recognize that there's a pattern here. And then uh -huh. the poet is actually going against the pattern in some places or, or changing it. And Tom, Tom Shippey and I, I mean, we come at it from slightly different angles, but like Tolkien, you know, the, the, we all agree that the poet is the, the poet of Beowulf as we have it is Christian. Mm -hmm. And I think he's uncomfortable or doesn't believe in, or just doesn't want there to be like non-Christian working magic. I see. Like it's, it's probably that he doesn't believe that such a thing would ever work. I you see. know that that so no monsters can't cast spells. Monsters might exist, but they're just monsters, and mm -hmm. their spells and their magic and so forth doesn't work. So I'm not mentioning it. Except then he's like, shoot, why is Grendel immune to swords? Right. You know, and I have to do something um, there. But well, that, that's that, so. Those are the, the complications. The other thing is, at one point, um, it is said that Grendel um, wouldn't pay wear guild. So wear guild is a man price. The wear means man. In fact, the word man in Anglo-Saxon did not mean masculine human. It meant any human. And you had to qualify it with either wear, uh, which meant man that way, or weef. So weef man is female man, which becomes the word woman mm -hmm. later on. So anyway, Grendel is, uh, it won't pay wear guild, man gold. So my question is, could he have? Mm. Where did he get gold? I guess there's gold, you know, in his in his lair uh, that Beowulf doesn't take. Um, but did he have pockets? Like, did he, you know, how did this work in, in right. this system? And, and there's a few other little, like, questionable, like, features like that with, like, the, he had forsworn um, swords. You know, he has this dragon skin bag. At one point, he says that he he left to go into the company of devils. But another 
point, it says that uh, he bore God's anger and he's a fiend in hell rather than like in the swamp. Mm. So there, there's, there's a lot of these. And, and again, I think to the original audience, all made sense. Sure. But um, to, to us, we have real trouble figuring out like what the heck is Grendel? And I think that that comes around to your next question. So go ahead with that. Well, well, I, I mean, what I wanted to ask is, is it possible that the Beowulf uh, poem is unfinished at all? I mean, one of the things that, that, that I've heard a reading of the Aeneid is that since the Aeneid really ends abruptly with like Turnus dying, some people have wondered whether, okay, is that the, did it, Virgil intend to end it like that? Or maybe he was intending to extend it more? I mean, it, it, with, with respect to Beowulf, are we sure that, that this is the, the, the finished product or what's the consensus view? So I think it's a definitely a finished product. It wraps up beautifully. Um, and I don't think there's any parts that are, that are missing, um, but two things. One is like, like Tolkien, I think it's been messed with a little bit in mm. the copying. You know, that, that there's a couple places where some things have been added. And so possibly there are also play, like, so there's a, at one point, the poem says that the Danes, at times, they made sacrifices at the pagan temple um, uh, because that was what they did. And some right after that, it, it, the only part in the poem that ever seems particularly like Christian or like sermon-like, it basically says, don't do that. Woe will it be if you make sacrifices to devils, but well will it be if you embrace God and can be brought with him. And so, and my thought is, and this fits the timeline too, uh, if the poem was written in the 750s, there aren't any pagans left in England. Nobody's been pagan in England for two generations at that point. Right. So it's, it's easy enough to say, yeah, they made sacrifices at the pagan temple, those poor dummies, you know, from before right. they got missionaries to tell them the right thing. But if the poem's then being recopied in the ninth or particularly the 10th century, well, there's pagans living down the street, right? They're Vikings. Sure. They've invaded. They sure. still sure. worship Thor and, and Odin and they make sacrifices and stuff. So maybe the sense is, I can't just say like at times they made sacrifices, no big deal. I need to say like, and that's bad. It's really right. bad. Don't right. do it. Um, and so those are the things. And then the other part is, of course, that any poem, the poet relies on what, what he or she is sure the audience knows and doesn't need to explain it, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, if you write a novel now, you don't have to tell everyone, like, where is Washington, D.C., or what's a secretary of state or something like that. Right. So there are times in, in Beowulf that we can figure out, like, these illusions, but there's other times it's totally opaque, so, um, for example, my favorite part in Beowulf is after Grendel's mother has, uh, you know, taken the arm back and killed one of Hrothgar's men, and Beowulf's like, how are everything's going? And remember, that's when Hrothgar goes, oh, sorrow is renewed. Ashera is dead. Ermenlaf's older brother. And the poem just goes on. Right. And we're like, who's we're supposed to know people, right? Why, why, why do we care about Ermenlaf? And it must be that there were, as soon as someone heard that, they're like, oh my gosh, that poor family, you know, mm -hmm. or something. Can you believe his older brother got eaten by a monster too? Or like, oh, if it was only Ermenloff, he would have killed her because he was a superhero fighter about mm -hmm. monsters. We just, we just have no idea. So it's, it's what time has, has done uh, to the, the poem more than, than like the poet not finishing it. Um, right. th that just like we don't have the references and in an ironic and I think kind of beautiful uh, feature of all this is that those broken references right like those places where the audience and the author knew exactly what was being referred to but we don't anymore Tolkien stole that as and used it as a technique in the Lord of the Rings that makes us feel like the Lord of the Rings is more real because it actually has some of the same feel as Beowulf. So when they're, they're sitting in Moria in, in the dark and everyone's scared and then Aragorn says, don't be afraid. Um, I would trust Gandalf more than the cats of Queen Beruthiel. And nobody goes, the who's? Right. <laughs> you know, there's no explanation. And in fact, when Tolkien wrote that, he had not even come up with a story of the cats of Queen Beruthiel. Mm. And it's those kind of little 
Now it turns out like a lot of the other hints and names that like that turn out to be things that were references to the Silmarillion. So you can figure them out once the Silmarillion was published. Sure. But sure. for part of the, 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 the impression of depth as Tolkien described it, uh, he stole it from Beowulf. He just, he just made the things up, you know, or left them unconnected. Uh, or connected to his Silmarillion stories that were not published when the Lord of the Rings was published. So like, that's, that's what I think is the unfinished or the, the, it's more like a ruin. It was once finished, but now it's fallen down and you have to reconstruct it in your mind. Sure. Sure. That makes sense. Um, and if I can also ask, are there any, uh, in the poem itself, are there any allusions to Christianity or, or explicit references to Christianity or maybe to the Old Testament. I know you mentioned that that, that one uh, line about sacrificing to uh, to pagan gods and you shouldn't do that, but are there any other significant uh, references? Yes, and and the, the kind of the most famous ones, and this is this is actually the the one of the problems with interpreting the poem. So despite the fact that it seems completely obvious that the poet is a, a Christian, Mm -hmm. um, just by his his outlook, uh, the, the the way he describes things, and a couple of references. The Jesus never appears. He's kind of important to Christianity, and yet is never mentioned in Beowulf, sure. nor the Virgin Mary, nor the saints, nor the Trinity, or or any of those things. In fact, the only explicit references to Christianity are two references to Cain and Abel, and one reference to the, the giants, giants on the earth being destroyed by the flood. Mm. Um, and weirdly enough, in both cases that there's references to Cain, his name's spelled wrong. Oh. Um, so he's, at one point it says uh, Cam rather than Cain. And so people have done a lot of like, oh, that means it's not Cain, um, it's, the, it's Ham or Hem, the son of Noah who um, is being referenced here with the problem being that the next line says, who slew Abel. Sure. So it's hard not, you know, but again, you can think, okay, if a later writer reads, reads Cam and th thinks it should be Cain, then he's going to say who slew Abel. Then, then why the heck didn't he fix Cam and change it to Cain? Uh, if he was doing that, like that's, it's hard to figure it out. In the other place camp, it's done as camp, which is battle. Um, I mean, one of the real reasons is that the, uh, the, the copyists of Beowulf sort of copied word by word, word for word, rather than like sort of reading it. That's, I guess, how you know, most medieval copyists work. And so, you know, they didn't realize something was a proper name. And therefore, if they saw something sort of close. Um, so, for example, there's a character whose name is Aemer. You may recognize him in The Lord of the Rings. Um, in Beowulf, his name gets copied as Yeomor, which means mournful. It doesn't even make sense. It needs to be a noun, and instead, it's a it's an adjective there. So, um, so so essentially, you've got these references to Cain, and it's said that Grendel is of the kin of Cain, and and that actually makes sense, like kind of biblical esoteric uh, material about you know where did when when Cain like was exiled and where did you get uh, you know, future other people sure. from there since there weren't any other humans on earth at that point, right? You had Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, then Cain kills Abel and then Cain is exiled. And then you get the other son, uh, Seth, but mm -hmm. like, and so the Bible says like that, you know, that the, uh, the sons of uh, the, the, basically the fallen angels or whatever came and they mated with the, the, children of Cain, but it's, it's all very unclear. Sure. Um, and that sort of like seems to be where, where Grendel is said to descend from, but it's hard to figure out. And, and all I can say is that the Cain and Abel story, I think made way more sense to the Anglo-Saxons as sort of the source of badness and evil than the Adam and Eve and the Apple story. Sure, I, as I understand it, oh. Um, um, so sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. So what, what are you going to say? Um, well, as I understand it, I mean, the, 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 the theme of kinslaying, killing your own family, that, that, that was very much, uh, like a very terrible crime, more, more so to towards the Anglo-Saxon 
people, I mean, it's bad today. I mean, I would, I would not, you know, go around mm -hmm. killing my family members, but, but it, it, it was such a terrible crime back then for, 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 for another member of the family to kill another member of the family. And is that being alluded to here? Like, okay, this is probably the worst possible thing that a person can, can do is kill their own brother. Yes. I think that's exactly it. So because, um, there's this Weregeld system that we that I, re I referred to, right? Mm. Uh, man price. So it's not that you could kill someone and like, that's okay, I have enough cash to cover him. Um, but that it was a way that you could settle a feud, right? Two people get in a fight, one gets killed. Instead of having uh, an eternal, you know, back and forth of families getting revenge on each other, someone can intervene and say like, we're gonna settle this with the man price. But the one place you couldn't pay where guild was within the family, mm. because that would be like taking money out of your right pocket and putting it in your left pocket and thinking you've paid yourself. Sure. Um, and so brother killing was the, the inexpiable sin for, uh, for Anglo-Saxon culture. And so I think when they're, you know, being converted to Christianity and they see um, you know, the, the story about a brother killed another brother, they're like, of course that makes sense. Sure. Yes, that's where all the evil came from. We knew it. <laughs> you know? Right, and, right. And much more than like, you're not supposed to eat this fruit, which I mean, you know, I'm sure they can understand the logic behind that, but it was just, it was a way more like emotionally powerful thing. Like the first brother killed his brother and his blood poured into the land and everything has been bad since then. And the Anglo-Saxons were like, yep, that's, that, that makes intuitive sense to us in our, in our culture. So, yeah. and that's why I think that, uh, well, for that reason and the other reason that I think Cain shows up is, is that the, sto the, the story of the Danish um, family is one of kin killing. In other words, that the audience would have known that if like that Grendel sort of represents what's going to happen in this family later, or maybe even what's already happened. I see. Right. That because we know for sure that left after Hrothgar, King Hrothgar dies, um, at least with all the names match up, that it's not his sons that take over but his nephew, and it seems like the nephew kills the son or sons in order to take over. And in return, he gets killed by another cousin who then also gets, gets killed. So like the, um, the, the problem for the Danish royal family is kin killing. And so it makes sense then that they're afflicted by this monster that represents kin killing. I and I think that that's like, that's how Beowulf is, you know, integrated into, um, into Christianity. And it, and it makes it again, it makes sense that they knew that those people weren't Christian yet because they, you know, they had stories from their, from their uh, great grandparents or so about when the missionaries came and converted them. Sure. But they, they also you know so they were interpreting it through a, a christian worldview but they knew the past was was pre-christian pagan and beowulf is a way of getting all of that to make sense if i can ask one more uh posing question uh are there i know we talked about how tolkien was a big beowulf scholar in, in the early 20th century and how he sort of revolutionized uh Be beowulf scholarship are there any significant similarities between tolkien's Lord of the Rings or Hobbit and, and Beowulf. I know we alluded to uh, the, the the cup and being stolen and how there's a similarity between uh, Bilbo and Smaug, how he takes a cup and that and, and he realizes, okay, someone someone's here, someone's stolen my my treasure. Are there any other significant similarities? Well, a lot of the 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 influence of of, of uh, Beowulf, it's it's so it's hard to like go through and you know, despite the fact that Tolkien flat out says like you know the. the the whole scene with Smaug and Smaug the dragon himself, um, you know, he has this, he's not the Beowulf dragon because the Beowulf dragon can't talk or anything. It's just more of a beast. Um, mm -hmm. But like the Tolkien scholars have been spending forever, like trying to find which, what source is what, obviously the name Aemer um, is another, or the fact that the, uh, the Rohirrim all speak Anglo-Saxon, um, you know, and other people could argue that Boromir is much more of like a Beowulf-like character, you know, who relies on his his great strength and bravery, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and in, in, in 
other ways. But I, I think it's more in, in the way that, that Tolkien creates the story, both through the impression of, of depth um, thing I, I was talking about about earlier, but but also just the the structure of Beowulf, where you have this you know you have the, the story of him fighting the monsters, and you have the story of the dragon, but you have all these other like side stories. They're usually called digressions, but they're not just digressions. They all contribute something to the story. Where characters within the 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 poem will tell a story about. You know that 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 explains uh, not obviously, but explains something else, and and I think that that's um, it's what a, a great scholar uh, who passed away recently, uh, Richard West, talked about. He called it Tolkien's um, interlace, interlacements in in Beowulf and um, the Lord of the Rings, and that to me is the biggest thing that Tolkien takes from from Beowulf is that that interlaced uh, complex plot where all the side pieces, it turns out in the end, get integrated into the main line. Um, but when you're going through them, it's not obvious what they're doing, except entertaining you. I see. And then yet it's like, oh, and that's why, you know, there's this whole old forest and the Barrow Downs thing and like what Tom Bombadil, what is all that doing later on? And then it's like, oh, well, that shows in the Council of Elrond that there are some things that the ring is not, doesn't have power over, but on the other hand, they can't do anything against the ring either. And, and mm. so, so I think that that's really, um, you know, it, Tolkien didn't just like, I mean, he knew Beowulf backward and forward. He'd memorized large chunks of it and could recite it, but he wasn't like mining it for incidents. It was more that he was inspired by he was inspired to fill in the gaps um, or to come up with reasonable explanations for what might be behind something. And also he's inspired by individual words he comes across or, or ideas. Uh, I, I mean, this is the last, uh, maybe I can give you this. There's a, there's a section in Beowulf that um, is very unclear what it was. So it's basically when, um, when Beowulf and his men are getting off their boat, the, the manuscript script says something like, um, uh, Guthmod Gruman, and Guthmod is war mind, and Gruman is like loud. It doesn't make any sense, and people have amended it in various ways. And Tolkien figured out, and of course nobody knew this until 2014 when this was translation was published, that Grimon. Uh, Gruman had been a, a double mistake. So first someone had, it was supposed to say something like um, Guthmod Grima, and then it made it to Guthmod Griman, and then Guman, and then the, the scribe looked at that, like that doesn't make any sense, and then just puts Gruman in there. But what it originally was, was Guthmod Grima, and Grima means mask. So these are like the war fierce masks. And if you picture the Sutton Hoo helmet that, that you, you, you know, now we know since we've dug things up that in fact, the helmets that they would have been wearing would have had this like facial mask part. But for Tolkien, what this did is he got this word grima, meaning mask in his head. And that becomes the name of worm tongue. Mm. Grima worm tongue. He's a mat. He's wearing a mask. He's, he's false to, to everyone, uh, you know, around him. And you can sort of see this in lots of cases. Tolkien's student, Simone Dardenne, uh, is working on a text called The Life and the Passion of St. Juliana, that in it has the first use of the word burglar in, in English. And he's working with her in that in like the early 30s. And then The Hobbit comes out and burglar is an important word. Right. And so I think what you get is just like, these are the things, he called it the leaf mold of the mind. You know, the things that are bubbling up in his, in his head because he's studying them, he's looking at them, he's trying to, you know, use his incredible philological talents to figure things out. And then when he does, uh, one is he solves it in his, in his scholarship, but two is that words then like kind of lodged in his head and it comes out in another way, some a creative idea. All right, then. Well, and then if I can ask maybe a sort of closing uh, uh, question or, or if you have any final uh, re remarks, um, uh, 
what, what would you recommend for, uh, for for our listeners who might want to continue uh, studying or investigating uh, the the Beowulf poem? I, I would recommend uh, the, the 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 writings that Tolkien's written, but you know, the, the, as you said, they're 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 growing to be about a hundred years old. I mean, <laughs> Beowulf scholarship has probably mo- 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 expounded upon uh, that and moved mo- 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 past uh, Tolkien. But are there any uh, scholars you'd recommend, or a- a- any uh, secondary source? You, you yeah, recommend? I would recommend just about anything written by Tom uh, Tom Shippey, T. A. Shippey. He's the 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 greatest Tolkien scholar. Um, he sort of helped create the field as like a serious uh, type of, of scholarship. Um, his book, Laughing Shall I Die? The Lives and Deaths of the Great Vikings actually has a chapter that uh, includes Beowulf and gives better context than almost anything I can else I can recommend. And then his two books about Tolkien, um, The Road to Middle Earth and J.R.R. Tolkien, author of the century, are sort of like the, the foundational uh scholarly texts, and they really work through the details of Tolkien's scholarship and how it fits into his, um, his art. So I would recommend anything um, written by, by Shippey. There's a lot that you can find online um, also uh, by, by him. And um, there's, that would be a, a really good place to start, I, I think, uh, as well as, you know, Tolkien's own writings, uh, you know, the, he didn't write, I mean, the, the Beowulf translation that he did, that's a very, it's not just that the translation's readable, but he, the commentary as Christopher Tolkien has edited it makes a lot of sense. And you can sort of, you can follow the logic to, like to how he was figuring things out about the poem. So I can, I can recommend that one also. Dr. Drought, thank you so much for coming on. Th- thank you. It was my, it was my pleasure. Um, and um, I'll, look, I'll look forward to, you know, seeing how this all comes together.